Turn your Bibles over to Revelation 2. Uh, <clears throat> as you all know, Pastor's not here, so he had me uh, prepare the message today. And um, this, this was on Wednesday, so I kept thinking about the message that I was going to preach. And then, uh, yesterday morning, turn over to Revelation 2. Yesterday morning, I woke up to the news that a friend of, our, uh, of mine, actually, and uh, a pastor in uh, El Monte, California, he uh, pastors a church that's called First Works Baptist Church. Um, they had uh, attacked his church and firebombed it in an act of domestic terrorism because he's been preaching the Word of God. So, you know, he's been under protest for the last month. And then just yesterday, I guess people decided to finally follow through with their threats and decided to actually bomb the building. And, and I mean, it's, an, it's, it's considered an IED and just basically try to destroy the building. Obviously, I don't know that the people that did it knew what they were doing because it didn't, it didn't blow up the building. It just blew up like it broke. Win- I mean, it was a blast. It, it broke windows. There was shattered glass. It was also defaced and there was graffiti all over the place, you know, from the supposedly loving individuals who are here to ask us to, you know, love and not hate. And so the title of the message is The First Works, The First Works, and it's a call to action to us as Christians that we need to now more than ever stand on the Word of God. You know, and a lot of times, you know, as, as preachers, we, we preface maybe a tough sermon and we say, hey, look, you know, I'm going to preach a tough thing in the Bible and you might find it offensive or, you know, but you, you know, this is the Word of God. But to be honest with you, the more that this, these attacks come, the more sick and tired I get it of the fact that people just, you know, Christianity and Christians in general just aren't standing up for the Word of God. You know, it shouldn't offend us to hear the truth of God's Word. It shouldn't offend us to know that God loves, but He also hates. It shouldn't offend us to hear the fact that the Bible is God's Word, inerrant, infallible in every way. Whether it's in Genesis or in Revelation, that's God's work. Now, the reason that I named it the first works is, is obviously in a way in reference to the, the, the title of, I mean, or the name of that church, First Works Baptist Church, but also they get their, their name from Scripture. And if you go to Revelation 2, I'm going to focus on a couple of things that we want to do right in God's eyes that will put a target on you, but it's okay because God's the one that's going to avenge us anyways, right? You know, this church, in my opinion, is doing God's will, and they're doing the right thing by standing up for the Word of God, and fighting against the tide of evil that's coming more and more every day. You know, if you go there to Revelation 2.1, but let's let's look at the scripture. Revelation 2.1, it says, and obviously Revelation is talking about the end times, but there's a lot of reference to just, you know, different churches, and these are the letters to the seven churches, we know that, that went out to all those churches at that time that, that John wrote, and it says, and unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith that he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden sticks, I mean candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they're apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. So Jesus is saying here some positive things. You know, you know God's noticing some good things about him. He's, he says, look, I know your works, and your labor, and your patience, and how you can't, you can't stand them that do evil. He says, and has borne and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. I mean, he's talking about how they've done good work and they're not, you know, they're not giving up. He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left, the, uh, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And then just look two verses down in verse 7. It says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So obviously, we have to have an ear to hear the word of God. And here he's telling them, he's, uh, he, he's, uh, he's, 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 I guess, commending them for the good stuff. But he also says, look, you left your first love. You left the first works. And when we read this in context and we study out the Bible, 
What's the first love? Is our love for souls that are going to hell? You know, we want to pull people, we want to pull them out of the pit of hell. The first works are soul winning. It's, it's going out there and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also the, when, when God sent them out in the final, in the Great Commission, also when Jesus sent them out, he sent them out two by twos, but also in the Great Commission, he says, teaching them everything. He says, don't just disciple them, don't just lead them to Christ, but disciple them and teach them everything that's in this book. You know, and that requires us to preach the entire counsel of God. And the, so, you know, these are the first works. And what are our first works? What are we supposed to be uh, focused on? What is the duty of Christianity? What is the duty of this church? What's the duty of churches throughout this nation and throughout the world that they need to do in order to be commended of God and to, you know, know that we are going to sit and have the rewards and the recompenses and the crowns that God has promised for us in eternity. You know, the Bible, and I've said this before, says that you can make it to the kingdom, but, you know, there's people who are going to be least in the kingdom. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, I don't want to be least in the kingdom. You know, I don't know where I'll rank. You know, I got saved older, older in life and, you know, just... I, I didn't grow up in a uh, Bible-believing, safe by grace Christian home. We went to church, but it was a false religion. But it doesn't matter. I can fight for those rewards now. You know, and, and the world will have you cower in fear thinking that, you know, when you back a church like this that's preaching against sodomy, that's preaching against sin and against the perverseness of this world, that you're doing the wrong thing. But God says otherwise. I mean, he, he commended them. He's like, look, you're doing this good, good work. You're doing these things, but you've left your first work. Why would a church get targeted like that unless they were doing the will of God? You know, because the Bible talks about how if they hate you, who do they hate? Jesus. You know, if they hate you, it's because they hate God Almighty. And so before we get to the point, and I just got a couple of points of Things that I think as a church, as, as our church, Springcrest, that we should do. And by the way, you know, I, Pastor Cobb, not only have we been in communication because he was going on this, uh, uh, um, he was going to do this funeral today, but obviously he's, he's not feeling well. You know, but I brought it up and, and he stands on the word of God. You know, I'm not preaching something that's just of my own volition. I'm preaching something that this church stands for. I mean, if you've never been to Springcrest Baptist Church and long enough, you've, then you just don't know that Pastor Cobb preaches strong against the sodomites. I mean, he, he's gotten up here before and said they're worthy of death. Not only that, the Bible has a death penalty for them that's stoning. Those are, those are words that come out of his mouth, but they've come out of his mouth because it's in the Bible. You know, it's not his opinion or my opinion preached today. It's God's word that's being preached today. You know, but just real quick in a way of introduction, I want to make it clear that we stand with churches like that. You know, we stand with First Works Baptist Church. We stand with any, any church that believes the Word of God. And I'm not just taking, you know, liberty here. Pastor Cobb knows of, of churches that have struggled in the past. I mean, at one point there was a church that got protested, Verity Baptist Church, because they, you know, they, they didn't mourn the death of, of a bunch of sodomites in Orlando. You know, and other churches that like, and this is not something new under the sun. As a matter of fact, before I, I before I came here this morning, somebody had posted about how back in 1983, a Baptist church in San Francisco got vandalized, and they actually spit and and assaulted the church members because they preached hard against sodomy. Obviously, it's in San Francisco. That you know, San Francisco has been the pit of hell for for over 40, 50 years. But what really stood out to me was that at that time, when that vandalism and attack happened, 300 pastors showed up in, in unity and in support of this one church, of this one pastor. If other, if other pastors in that area, in El Monte, which is near L.A., show up today, I'd be surprised. You know, because the reality is most pastors... Most churches won't back a church like that because they don't want the bad publicity. And you know why they don't want the bad publicity? It's not because they don't agree with the Word of God. As a matter of fact, if you talk to most Christians, they'll tell you that that, that lifestyle not only is a sin, but it's disgusting. I mean, forget the, 
just the church, I mean, if you just talk to the world in general, I mean, even before I was a Christian, you know, there's no way I want to hang out with a sodomite. You know, that's gross. I mean, I, I didn't grow up with my butt. My bo As a matter of fact, we had a game growing up. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not a, a politically correct game now, but I'm pretty sure most of you played it. Smear the Queer, right? You play Smear the I mean, these are games that we grew up playing because we knew the difference between men and women. We didn't want this confusion in our lives. But let me not get off on tangent. I want to keep it on ta track. But just real quick, it, and what's interesting is the way they vilify this pastor and these church members. You know, um, I'm not, I didn't, there was a lot of articles. I mean, you can Google it. There's, and I didn't, obviously, for the sake of time, I didn't put them all here. But uh, KTLA 5, I guess it's uh, one of the channels, Channel 5. This is the title of the, of the article. FBI investigates bomb attack at anti-LGBTQ church in El Monte. Of course, it's anti the alphabet suit. But instead of saying, I mean, that's an act of domestic terrorism. You know what I mean? That's that's a serious crime. If you go and you bomb a federal building, I mean, they will search high and wide and deep to make sure you get thrown. But this church, it's just an investigation. We'll see. And then uh, the I guess it's there's like the city commissioner or manager. It's not the mayor. Like wrote a tweet. Her name's Ilda Solis. And she, this is her tweet. She says, violence is never the answer, even in the response of hate speech. Notice, notice the word in here, All right? Although we do not know the motive. What do you mean you don't know the motive? They've been protesting this church for a whole month. There's been threat of arson. As a matter of fact, they filed a police report that there was threat of violence and arson from these sodomites at this church. It says, I'm aware that the anti-LGBTQ and mis misogynistic sermons given by the pastor at First Works Baptist Church by the way, they, they say misogynistic because, you know, the Bible preaches that who's the head of the household? The man. And that the wife should stay home bearing the children, taking care of them, and apparently that's offensive. So there, she's clearly against God's word. And it says, uh, and she says, and my office has, ref uh, has referred concerning matters pertaining to the pastor, to the county human rights commission, who has been working in collaboration with the city of El Monte to de-escalate de the situation. By the way, it's really weird for me to say El Monte because it's El Monte, but I know that that's not how they pronounce it, so I'll, I, that's why you hear me struggling with that. Uh, I value inclusivity, inclusivity, diversity, and equality. I also support the right to peaceful protest. However, an attack is wrong and it's dangerous. And then she says she urges uh, city leaders, church leaders, and civic leaders to come together and work together to address hate issues in our community. And she then thanks law enforcement or whatever. But... Bottom line, she's not sad that it was attacked. She's just sad that it was the wrong people who attacked. See, because what they want to pin is the fact that we preach that sodomites are worthy of death and that we're inciting violence. That's not what we're doing. And let me make that clear even from this pulpit. I'm not telling you to go out and commit hate crimes against anybody. The Bible says God hates sodomy and it's worthy of death. And it's a death penalty if we had a righteous government. So if we had a righteous government, that's exactly what the penalty should be. And as a matter of fact, it's not that long ago that this country had the death penalty for sodomy in its early years. And later on, as it, as it evolved, then they had a, it was a crime still up until like the 1970s. So this is not anything that, you know, we're, we're just taking out of context. But we're not inciting violence. We're not a asking people to go out and, you know, we, we have a spiritual battle. And it's more clear now than ever that it's a spiritual battle because all these churches in our church are doing is preaching the word of God and people are saying that we're hateful for preaching God's word. You know, uh, KABC, and like I said, I just took snippets. It's only three of them. Don't, we're not going to read all the articles or anything like that. KBC 7 says, El Monte church explosion, vandalism prompt multi-agency investigation. This really stood out to me. There, uh, I guess there's a lieutenant here and it said, it appeared that the walls to the church had been vandalized as well as the windows. So when the report came out, they said a possible explosion. They already knew it was an explosion, but the media always lies, right? So they, they came out as a possible explosion. And then he gives it away. He says, uh, El Monte Police Lieutenant Christopher Cano said, the windows appeared at first to be smashed. Then we realized the windows were not smashed, that they had actually blown out from some type of explosion. If you go online, there's a Twitter, uh, I guess somebody was out and about at that time, and they recorded it. 
I showed it to Trey this morning before we got started. And the windows, the explosion was so vast that it blew, the, the, the glass shattered all the way across the city block to the other side, to the gasoline station across. I mean, that's a serious blast, you know. Then Los Angeles Times, and then we're done with uh, you know, all the articles, but it says here, it says the church has been the site of protest in recent weeks because of its teaching promote bias against the LGBTQ community. An online petition asking Almonte's mayor to remove the church from the city has gathered more than 14,000 signatures. There's no indication that the protests were related. Listen to this. There's no indication that the protests were related to the arson threat or subsequent attack, Reynoso said this uh, Saturday. This is the chief of police. He says, I don't even want to talk about the protest because it wouldn't be fair in any way, shape, or form to link the two together. Look, you know how I feel about politics. But I am going to say one thing. It's funny how a bunch of people stormed the Capitol on January 6th. And all right away, they linked it to the president and the right wing agenda without doing all their investigation. But here, knowing that they had threats from the LGBT community, knowing that they want to shut them down, he's like, I don't, I don't know if these two things line up. You know, I don't. Th these guys are trained to investigate. You're telling me you can't put two and two together? I mean, I'm not even a police officer. I can put two and two together. He said, we cannot speculate that anyone involved in previous demonstrations is connected to or involved with this in any way. The group that organized the protest, Keep Almonte Friendly, issued a statement expressing profound shock and said a demonstration plan for Sunday outside the church would be canceled. It says, we understand that what they preach can make people upset. The group wrote in a statement released via social media. However, we would never promote or encourage or condone any violence or acts of harm. That's not true. That's not true at all. I mean, it, it, I've had to, you guys don't know because I, Mary Sarah, thank God she helps me with social media. I'm, I'm not as good as, as some of these young guys, but anytime I post anything about the Bible that has to do with this subject, you know, we get a bunch of sodomites putting a bunch of filthy stuff on there. Just filthy posts of men doing unseemly things. And, you know, I'm not going to pervert your minds this morning. They're disgusting. And they're out to just pervert the nation and pervert your families and pervert your friends and your family. We got to, you know, if we don't stand up for it now, it's only going to get worse. But anyways, the purpose of this sermon today, by the way, they were all over the news. They even made it on Drudge, which, you know, that's a big deal if you made it on Drudge. You've made the news. So if you go on Drudge Report today, if you just scroll down a little bit, you'll see about the explosion. But, you know, I don't want to steal, you know, or ride their light. What I want to do is put more spotlight on that type of Christianity, on that type of preaching, on that type of stands. You know, the Bible says that we are a light that has to shine. And think about how much light is shining from those acts. You know, we don't look at Churches like that in pity and say, oh, you know, poor little old First, ba uh, First Works Baptist Church or whatever church. And if it ever happened here, we should never be in pity. We should be glad that we get to rejoice in Christ's suffering. You know, turn over to Matthew 5. Turn over to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, and like I said, I've only got a couple of points this morning, but I just wanted to, this is, I wanted to focus on the introduction. Matthew 5, the Bible tells us that these things are going to happen. As a matter of fact, God gives us a warning in Matthew 5, verse 10, he says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. It's a blessing, the Bible says, to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. It says, For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. It's a blessing for people to talk lies about you. The Bible says, but what does verse 12 say? It says, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works 
and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Hey, it's time to let our light shine. You know, if it blinds some people, so be it. You know, I'm not asking us to go out. As a matter of fact, probably most people won't ever listen to this sermon. We, we're not that big of a church. We don't have that big of a phone. But hey, we need to let our light shine here. You know, I'm not saying we, need, we don't need to make world news. We need to make an impact here in the city of Houston. You know, we have people that are going to hell every day here within this uh, zip code and the zip code surrounding us. That's our duty. Those are the first works. The attacks, they're going to come whether we like it or not, if we're letting our light shine. But that's what we need to focus on. You know, that light is shining today, shining bright, and that's great for them. Praise the Lord. But it should be a call for us to shine our light and to also voice our concern and our stands for that, the truth. We either, we're either with God or we're against God. And that's a biblical, I mean, I paraphrase, but that's a biblical statement. 1 Peter 2.9 and while I'm in 1 Peter 2, 9, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 9, But ye are a chosen generation. We're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas, that, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of his visitation. Look, we glorify God because we have salvation and we know who is almighty. We know who is a terrible God, who is a God who is going to avenge the wicked, avenge us from the wicked. But we also know that one day all, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And a lot of that is going to be because of our good works. It says, they shall behold, glorify God in the day of his visitation. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Look, last year when the pandemic was at its peak, there was a lot of churches that were like, well, we're going to show up. We're not going to, you know, and, and they were making national news, you know, and getting all that spotlight. But a lot of these churches were false churches or false preachers. And one of the point I'm trying to make right now is that, look, we want to do good works because we're saved by grace. We want to do good works because we follow the word of God. The Bible is very clear that sometimes works are just in vain. You know, this church, Pastor Mejia didn't ask for this spotlight. The spotlight came to him. Because he's preaching the word of God. But you know, there's other churches that ask for that spotlight. If I recall last year, Joel Falstein was out there in the streets with Black Lives Matters protesting who knows what. I don't know if you remember that. He was like on Twitter and Facebook and stuff. And he was out there in the middle of all the protests, I guess, protesting social injustice. It was interesting how he was protesting with a bunch of bodyguards, right? Just to make sure that, you know, nobody hurt. And, you know, that's just, it, it's interesting the way people do we shouldn't do stuff just so we get noticed by men. We shouldn't please men. We should please God. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, I have not charity or love. I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have, char and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It not, it, it's not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seek not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh not evil. And then if we just look at verse 6, it says, Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in truth. You know, we're happy today because we have the Word of God. We're happy today because I know that I can get my truth from God's Word and I don't have to be confused about the world's trying to feed me. You know, last I checked, it's male and female, right? 
Last I checked, that's it. But the world would have you think that there's all these genders and, and you know, different things. I'm not confused because I rejoice in the truth. Last I checked, 2 plus 2 still equals 4. And if somebody threatens me with a crime and then they commit the crime, then I can put together, right, that it was the threat, now the crime. You know, there's an action, now there's a consequence. I'm not going to pretend like this over here didn't incite, you know, incite this. It's not like the pastor is pretending that he was attacked because it was just some random act. I mean, he knows and we know that it's because he's preaching the word of God. You know, I mean, that's the logical conclusion, right? You preach God's word, talk about your friends and family are going to be far and few between. First Corinthians, just a few verses down there in, uh, in verse 11, it says, when I was a child, and we all know this is the firm, famous uh, chapter of love, but what does he say? He ends with this. He's talking about, you know, how you better do things with the proper love. And the, you know, the only way we get love is from God because God is love. So we have to be saved in order to even understand love. That's how you know sodomy doesn't understand love because they don't have God in their lives. But anyways, 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man... Put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am also known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of, the, of these is charity. Look, there's nothing more lo loving than preaching against sin. There's nothing more loving than pulling people out of the fires of hell. I don't care what you tell me. I don't care how you want to justify it. I don't care if you want to put Mother Teresa on a pedestal. The most loving thing you can do is to get people out of hell. Because we're all appointed to die once in the flesh. But if you die in the spirit, that's it. You're done. And so I'm okay if we have to preach hard. Because the sin of sodomy is a sin that leads to a reprobate mind. And it leads to a rejected individual who can never have salvation. And so I'd rather, you know, inter inter intercept somebody that's on their way there and give them the gift of free salvation through Jesus Christ than have them lost for all eternity. And the other thing is, I love God more than I love man. And because I love God more than I love man, I also fear God more than I fear man. You know, people don't, Preach hard on the Word of God because they fear what man's going to do to them. And let me tell you, it's not easy to get up here and preach like this because you know that there's always consequences to hard preaching. But I'd rather go down and know that I'm going to be in heaven and know that God was looking at that than have the consequences of judgment of God because I cowered in fear. I mean, that's really the truth. But turn over to Romans 1, verse 26. Let me just tell you a couple of things. And, I, I, and I'm going to close on a positive. Let me just, let me just say that. But, and I, I do have some encouraging words. The Bible is actually very encouraging about these things. But let me tell you why we preach so hard against sodomites. And I'm not going to go into this deep thing. I mean, honestly, the Bible talks a lot about it, and, pe and people don't realize it. But it's kind of disgusting. But let me just give you some, some characteristics. And these are not all the characteristics, because I don't want, like I said, I don't want to spend too much time. But in uh, Romans, you're there in Romans 1. But in 2 Peter 2.12, it says, but these, as natural brute beasts. You know, the Bible says that they, they're so far gone, they're just beasts, they're animals. Made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of these things that they understand not, and shall be utterly perished in their own corruption. In Jude 1.10, the Bible says, But these speak evil of those things which they know not. This is a parallel passage. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Why are they beasts? Because they've left the natural use. You know, I mean, you ever heard, you ever grew up in a ranch or anything like that? And you ever heard, you know, dogs will hump anything. You know, they, they don't have a moral compass. It's unnatural. They're brute beasts. That's what you would, that's how you could describe not only a dog, but any animal. It's a brute beast. It doesn't have, brute means in Spanish, that, that word for me is easy because in Spanish, that was like a, a proper insult when you were being really dumb and you, you didn't have a good brain on your shoulders. Estás bien bruto. You know, you're real brute is what there's, they would say. And that meant like you're not thinking, you don't have a, a good brain on you, right? Romans 1.26 says, 
For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. So we're talking about something that you leave, that you don't do naturally. Look, it's natural to sin, but it's not, un, but it's not natural to like be attracted to the same gender. That's an unnatural sin. Or to a young child, right? The Bible says, And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the women burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the rec that recompense of their error which was meet. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind, reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You know, and uh, people say, well, Jesus didn't talk about sodomy. He didn't talk about the sodomite. Jesus actually addressed it. He just addressed it in a different way. You know, before we go there, turn over to Matthew 18, verse 6. But one of the characteristics of sodomites is that they're, they're, uh, they're not reproducers, they're recruiters. And they tend to be pedophiles. They're all pedophiles. You say, oh, I, I, look, I have two sodomite uncles. You know, I can speak from, I know these in people. I, I don't deal with them anymore. You know, I've cut them off from my life. But I grew up around that stuff. It's disgusting. So don't come and tell me that I've, I've not had first-hand experience. Now, thank God, my parents always protected us, so they never exposed us to more than just their vile words and the things that they would say. But that was enough to get an idea of their lifestyle. But Genesis 19.4, you guys turn Matthew 18. Matthew 18, but Genesis 19.4 says, this is the Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And there in verse 4 says, But before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed about the house. This is when they're trying to get to know the angels that came and said, both old and young. You know, because people always want to argue that the Bible doesn't say that they're pedophiles. It says they're both old and young. That means that they already had recruited the young. It says, all the people from every quarter, and they called unto Lot and said unto him, where are the men which came into, uh, into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And you know, in the Bible, thank God he doesn't put that perversion in your mind. But we know what this means. They didn't want to like sit down and have a dialogue. They were trying to, that's where we get that word sodomy, right? Sodomize them. In Mark, we see this reference, but you're there in Matthew 18, but we see this three times in three different gospels in Mark 9:42, in Luke 17, 2, and in Mark 18, 6. Jesus said, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones. And by the way, that offend, that word offend doesn't always just mean like, oh, you said something that offended me. It also means like a criminal act, like an act of violence against someone. That's an offense to someone. It says, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. That's what Jesus thinks of Sodom. It says, look, if you even hurt one of these, just tie a millstone around their neck and dump them in the sea. See, if Jesus were running around today, like if he was, you know, if they, if, if people thought, if, you know, if he, this is the way, let me back up. When Jesus came on the scene, they wanted this revolution, right? They wanted this king who was going to incite all kinds of violence. But instead he came, what, preaching the gospel. He was ready to die for our sins. But in the future, Jesus is going to come and he's going to rain the wrath of God upon those that didn't, that rejected him, right? It says the Bible that the, the, the wrath of God was poured on the people. And it's Jesus who's doing the damage. If you read the book of Revelation, there's rivers of blood flowing from the destruction. God is not happy with the state of this country. Jesus is not sitting around like some hippie going around singing Kumbaya. The reason he died for our sins is so that we wouldn't have to suffer the consequences of that sin. But the people that live that lifestyle, they love that lifestyle. They reject God and they hate him. So anyways, I just wanted to give you some characteristics. I don't want to get too much into it, but I'm going to leave you with three points. And that's it. Go to Matthew 16. These will go quickly. But the first thing is we have to stick to the first works. We've been doing it here at this church, and we better not quit. And as a matter of fact, it's my prayer that you hold me accountable and I hold you accountable. We better be soul winning. And we better be doing the first love. You know, in Matthew 10, verse 5, go to Matthew 16 for, for the sake of time, but Matthew 10, verse 5, 
It says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go into the way of the Gentiles into the city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I mean, Jesus, he established why we go soul winning two by two. He sent them out two by two. He said, go preach to the lost sheep. We need to do the work that is set before us. And the easiest part, the best part is, we're with the duty of the work, but salvation is free. It costs nothing. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Matthew 16, 13 it says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, because he's the one that established the church. This is, what I'm, this is the point I'm making here. Of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, say, whom do men say that, uh, that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. See, we need to maintain the truth. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know how the gates of hell will not prevail against this church? When we do the first works. When we do the first love. If we want to have the gates of hell not prevail against us, we need to stay the course. That should be our, our sole purpose in life. We need to go out there and fight that spiritual battle. Look, I'm not asking you to get your arms. And by the way, I'm, I'm for self-defense. The Bible is for it. Like, so if you're, you know, and I know we have church members that are packing today. I'm, it's great. Because if we're preaching this hard, you know, we might have people come in. It's all right. We know we're protected. But... But I'm not telling you to go out there and fight. You know, those are the fights that are in vain. What I want you to do is fight that spiritual battle. We need to go out there and put more effort and put more time and put more money and put more whatever to soul winning, to going out there and reaching the souls of men and women. But then the second thing is we need to preach the truth. We need to preach the word. Because the only way, they're, they're, they're not separate. If we preach the word, we're preaching the truth. Right? And we're preaching the truth, we're preaching the word. There's no way around it. We need to preach the word. Now from behind the pulpit, we need to stand behind men who are preaching God's word. You know, one of the reasons that my wife and I decided to stay at Springcrest many years ago was because we found a pastor who would preach the truth. You know, it wasn't because he's, and, and by the way, he's a great preacher, but it wasn't because he's a great preacher or because this is the nicest building in town or he had the nicest car, or he had the nicest suit, because he's willing to preach the truth. Not only that, he's proven. He's got a track record. I mean, at, at 84 years old, he's been preaching the truth for much longer than I've been alive. That's what I'm looking for, and that's what you should be looking for. Not only you, but you should have your family. Not everybody lives here in Springcrest. We have families that live in the, in the Houston area. There's good churches. Plug them in. Plug them in and get them to do the work. Go to John 3, 16, and I'll read real quick for you Galatians 4, 16. We're almost done. It says, am I therefore become your enemy? And I'm just putting this verse out there because that's how Paul felt. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I hope not. We have plenty of enemies in the world. I mean, people are going to attack us. I mean, they've already bombed one a church. It's only going to get worse. You know, my wife made a good point of me. The reason they're emboldened is because, you know, we have the left who's done nothing for the last year and a half when there's been uh, inciting of violence and, and rioting and there was no consequences. So, of course, they're just going to be emboldened to do it to anybody, especially those that don't go, uh, you know, that don't get along, go along to get along, right? You know, what I love is they interviewed uh, Pastor Mejia. And they say, you know, and he said, well, I'm just going to keep preaching the word. I'm not going to stop. He said, because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. He said, the only thing I fear is God. Those are the hands I don't want to be in. And you know what? I agree with him. I don't agree with him because he's, because he's super knowledgeable, although he is. 
I agree with him because he's preaching the truth. That's the truth. That's why I agree with him. When Pastor Cobb gets up here and says, they're worthy of death and they should be stoned, I agree with him. Pastor Cobb's right because God's right. I mean, it's either one or the other. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now pay attention. Verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that... Light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth, notice how he said he didn't just preach truth, but doeth truth, cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought, or that they are made in God. Look, we need to be that light on a shining hill. We need to hate the workers of iniquity. We need to hate the work of iniquity. That's why the Bible is constantly asked, having us pray to ask for forgiveness for our sins so we can clean up our life and be separate from the world. And this is the result. Go to Romans 12. Go to Romans 12. I got a couple of verses before that, and we're closing on Romans 12. Psalm 9, 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. Look, this nation's forgotten God. So of course the wicked are going to be turned into hell. Psalm 145, 20 says, but this is the, the positive. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. You know, most people look at what happened as a negative, but one of the things that, that uh, these, these filthy perverts were going to do was they were going to have a drag show in front of the church this morning in protest of that preaching. And so these families were going to have to come and figure out a way to reduce the exposure for their children from looking at that perversion. Because I don't know if you know anything about drag shows, and I'm not going to get, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to pervert you. But it is not, you know, it's not people dressing up like they're going to church. I'll just put it like that, right? It's very little clothes, and it's a lot of disgust, disgusting acts. That's what the drag shows, you know, are about. And like I said, I, like, I'm trying to keep it very, you know, that I am trying to keep PC because I'm not trying to pervert your, I'm not trying to put any wickedness in your mind this morning. Acts 20:24 20, says, but none of these things move me. You know, the apostles, Paul, just, you know, Acts is that great book where you see all this soul winning and churches growing and people getting saved. And it says, but none of these things move me when they're under attack. Neither count I my, my life uh, dear unto myself so that I might finish the course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Look, none of these things should move us. We know that sodomy exists here in Houston. I mean, there's a place called Montrose. You just go down there and you, you get plenty of that if, if that suits your, you know, your, uh, your palate. 1 Peter 4.12, and you're there, Romans. This is the last, second to last verses. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, think it not strange. This is not a strange thing that happened. It says, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. What does he say? What's the next verses? But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Look, God says, hey, we should be happy. And, and rejoice when men and women of God are attacked. But look, we should not only be happy, we should be happy when they attack us. When you lose your job, when you lose your opportunities, when people spit at you or blow your church up or you know, send you hateful messages, tell you that you're just some kind of you know, domestic terrorist, you should be happy. You know, that, that, the Bible says rejoice. That's the instruction. 
Go to Romans 12, you're ver there in verse 18. And this is the reason why it says, if it be possible. And like I said, we're not, I'm not inciting any kind of violence today. I'm actually giving you like clear instruction of how we should act as a church. And here the Bible is telling us, if it's possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Look, if it's possible, live your life in peace. You know, get up in the morning and spend time with your family and go to work and pay your bills and go to church and preach the word and go soul winning and just keep your head down and do the work. But unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, it just depends on your spiritual growth, right? When I first started reading the Bible, I was like, man, I don't know if I want to get persecuted. But the older I get, the more you read the Bible, it, you know, that's part of life. So I might as well just ro roll with the punches. But fortunately... That's going to happen if you're preaching the Word of God. But what does the Bible say? Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire in his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. See, the, the message is, the first works. We shouldn't go out and pick a fight. We shouldn't go out and insult these. By the way, it's a waste of time, you know, to talk to these, these reprobates. But it says here, look, just go out there and overcome evil with good. And don't avenge yourselves. Don't worry about the attacks. Don't worry about the things that are going to happen. And I know that this church has had attacks. You know, if you talk to pastor long enough, we know that things happen. God's going to handle it. God's going to take care of them. It says, the, the pit that they dig, that's the one they're going to fall in. They, they dig that pit for you, and they have a snare for you, and God's just going to protect you. You know, we're reading in Sunday school this morning, I'm closing out with that, that, you know, when, when God told Jacob to go to Bethel, he had to go through the wicked nations, as it said, that the, terrible, the terribleness of God kept those nations from messing with Jacob. And we know that God protected them through, throughout the entire time. So God's going to take care of us, even unto death. Because honestly, one of the greatest things to understand as a Christian is that we, we, need, you know, we need to look at death differently from, from the point of view of the Bible in the sense that when we die in the body, it's only the body that dies. We will never experience death. That's not even a thing that can happen to us. So even as you're going through pain and let's say you're going to get beheaded or they're coming at you and you're about to die, it doesn't matter because at some point your body's just going to be taken to heaven. I mean your soul and then you know we'll be reunited with our incorruptible bodies. And you know just read uh, the, the story of Stephen when he was martyred. Jesus stood up to receive him. He was still getting stoned and Stephen's already looking up into heaven. So we need to stand with men and women of God. Look. I'm here today because of Pastor Cobb. I'm here not only because he ordained me, but because he's a man of God that stands on the principles of the Word of God on truth. I'm not afraid to preach a message like this. Well, number one, I wouldn't be afraid in the, in the first place, but I, you know, in another church, I might be concerned that they might fire me or, or not keep me around or do things. But here, I'm not afraid because I know Pastor Cobb stands on truth. So if I didn't preach it, he'd be preaching it. It might not be the exact same message, but he's preached it before. And so if there's other pastors and brothers and sisters in Christ who are doing it, we need to stand with them. Because the world's uniting. And they're uniting for evil. We need to unite for good. The only way to overcome evil is with good. We need to go out there and do the first works. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach. Thank you for Springcrest, Lord, that we can be a light in this community, that we can continue to do the first works, that we can continue to do the first love. Thank you for Pastor Cobb and, and his leadership and, and his steadfastness and his uh, unwillingness to, unwillingly, uh, to be unwillingly moved from the truth. Lord, but not only for Pastor Cobb, but for churches and pastors in this country that still stand for truth and that they are unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord. Lord, be with uh, First Works this morning. Uh, may those congregants listen to a sermon that's preached and they may thunder through. 
and that it may spread your word and that it may continue to not return void unto you as your word has promised. Thank you for all that you do, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to preach. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.